Harsha, I think you can start now. We... Okay. I will start. Yeah. Uh, welcome back, my fellow bridge engineers. This is the last day of our series of lectures that we've been having. And I am very delighted to welcome with our, to our hold for the last lectures, Professor Holger Svensson himself live for the great benefit of you, for, for the great benefit of all of you all. Uh, Professor Holger Svensson has already been introduced. Uh, he will be speaking first today. Then there will be a few announcements and a vote of thanks. And we will be then breaking for two, three minutes. And then the last lecture will be had, which is the ship impact. So there's a switch in programs because Professor Svensson will have to leave us after the first lecture. So he goes yeah. first on bridge aesthetic, yeah. right? And with that, I just give you a brief introduction of Professor Svensson. You know, he retired as the chairman through his career with Leonard and Andra all over the world, building cable state bridges, designing cable state bridges in all materials, steel, steel composite and concrete. And over 30, 40 years of experience in this particular type of structure all over the world. And he rose right up to becoming the chairman of the, the famous firm, Leonard and Andra. And then he's now a consulting on his own right, teaching, consulting, at, at teaching at Dresden. The, the lectures that you see are actually recorded lectures, which he has kindly agreed to share with us, from which we have greatly benefited. So uh, Professor Swenson is truly a world authority, recognized as such in the profession. And his book, from which these lectures have been taken, The Cable State Bridges, 40 years of experience worldwide, is a sort of a landmark publication in this type of structure, this beautiful structure which we all like, and which immediately draws an appeal and instant sort of affection from us. So on that note, um, I would uh, uh, request uh, Vikas, have we any announcements that we make now, or shall we start with Professor Swenson's lecture and make the announcements later? Yeah, I think we can start. Uh, okay. We can no, start. Just, okay, we have two announcements to make. Uh, that is on the 28th of October, please note, from 11 to 1 o'clock, we'll be discussing wind engineering for long span bridges. This is the second of the series. Uh, Mr. K. Suresh Kumar, who is from RWDI, an expert in uh, you know, uh, wind engineering for all kinds of structures, along with our moderator, Professor Prem Krishna. You see that on your left. And on the right, you see that we'll be having a course on fatigue and fracture for bridges towards somewhere towards the end of this uh, uh, November. So with these two announcements, keep uh, glued. We will be uh, inviting you all to join. And uh, the course is a, probably a three-day course in November towards the end on fatigue. These are the two announcements we have to make. And with that, uh, may I request uh, Professor Swenson uh, with a great welcome from us to start uh, his first talk on aesthetics of cable state bridges. Yes, I will try. Well, during the construction of a cable state bridge, it is very much in the center of a general interest. But we must remember it's not only the five, six years of construction period, but the 50 or more years afterwards, when the bridge is very often in a prominent location viewed by many, many people, and they will uh, have their feeling about it. Therefore, we do not just only design a bridge for construction, so to say, but also for the many, many years it's standing around. Uh, yeah. Now, Marcus Vitruvius Pollio, the famous Roman uh, architect, wrote ten, day, uh, 10 books on architecture. And he stated in Latin briefness, firmitas, utilitas, and venustas as the most important three things and it's still uh, valid. So a uh, bridge must be firm, must stand up, it must serve its purpose, and it must be beautiful. Now, 
We will talk today about the Venast Venustas Beautiful. There are good looking bridges and bad looking bridges. And how are they perceived by different people? Well, it has to do to a great part by developing aesthetic judgment, by learning and education. You have to try, you, if you look at a bridge and try then uh, consciously to make clear why is it beautiful and why do I think it's not beautiful. Basically, there are two approaches to beauty, especially of bridges. The one is beauty lies in the eye of the beholder, which means it is a completely uh, individual decision. Or the other more technical form follows function. Now we know, especially with bridges of the 19th century, that to, for our feeling today is not true. Not all, all bridges which are properly designed are beautiful. Now, these two these definitions are taken up by the German poet Schiller in his treatise on grace and dignity. He feeds them together in a, a, a somewhat a, a dialectically way by saying both are important. It has to be the feeling and it has to be the technical part. So we will now go on 10 uh, aesthetic guidelines. These shall not be mixed up with a recipe for designing a beautiful bridge. That is not possible, <clears throat> but they can serve for judging by different aspects, whether a bridge is beautiful or is not beautiful. We go through these 10 uh, points. And we start with a clear, uh, uh, with a, uh, with a, stru uh, a stru clear structural system. The choice of a convincing and simple load-bearing system. A bridge must look trustworthy and stable. A mixture of different statical systems often leads to a bad uh, appearance. The number of different load-bearing elements shall be reduced to a minimum. A statically correct system, as I said before, is not necessarily beautiful. First example, the Caroni River Bridge in Venezuela has a remarkable span of 240 meters Although it requires uh, above the piers 14 meter depth, it does not appear clumsy because it's a run of the curve running at the underside. Here it is possible because the railway is running on top together with the, uh, rail with the, with the other traffic. And we have two uh, structural systems we have the strongly horned beam and we have the piers. Now, the Weitingen Bridge, on the contrary, impresses that it is a very long, 700 meter or so long bridge with constant depth going in one go over the Neckar Valley. In this case, 
the slopes were considered to be creeping. Therefore, we had two uh, side spans of 260 meters, which is a lot. And the problem was solved quite unique by applying air struts. I will show that uh, again later, which so to say for permanent loads, at least half the side span. And it was possible in this way to have a continuous constant depth girder. The arches are often an important consideration in aesthetics. There are two or three different points to consider. Either you can take the stiffness of the, uh, of the structure into the arch to take the bending in the arch. Then the arch has to be strong and you can have a very light uh, roadway which is hung from the arch. In this case, where there is solid rock on both sides, the arch can be fixed to the rock and as the moment they increase to the bottom, the uh, depth of the arch uh, increases. Now, this is one of those bridges which we did not build, but I still like it very much. It is our design for the Stonecutter Bridge in Hong Kong. And it's, it appears very light, not at least because the towers are in a curve going, going up and the number of, of stay cables are uh, small against uh, the others. Of course, a suspension bridge is very difficult to beat because there is just this simple uh, system which everybody can understand. We have the towers, we have the uh, main cables, and from the main cables, we hang down the beam. It is, I have to admit, very difficult for a cable stay bridge to beat a suspension bridge. Now, guideline two are good proportions. Good proportions in all three directions between the structure members or between length and heights of the bridge span. A balanced ratio must exist between the structural elements, the length and the heights of the span, between the lit and shadowed areas as well as the masses of beam, piers, and abutments. In this case, for the Moles of Valley, we have the main span in the center across the river, and where the slopes are decreasing the height of the bridge, the length of spans decreases so that we always have a standing rectangle. Either you can have a standing rectangle for high bridges or a lying rectangle for uh, lower bridges, but you should avoid to have a square there because that is somehow dull. The up to 180 meter high piers of the Kochertal Koch Valley Bridge with constant spans of 130 meters, these piers have a parabolic shape and this makes the bridge light and uh, unobtrusive uh, across the valley. The attractiveness of a three span haunched girder 
is shown here by the Rhine River Bridge. There are simple uh, reasons so that such a bridge looks beautiful. First of all, the depth in the middle must be double the depth of uh, the beam over the piers. And the end must have the same depth as in the center, and it must run parallel to the uh, roadway. With these simple uh, rules, one, to, to one and two for the main span, and the same depths at the ends, when these are applied judiciously, it will normally always result in a beautiful bridge. The Annapolis Bridge in uh, the USA is light that it has a haunched girder and up rising uh, piers. Quite contrary, this uh, you may not guess is a railway bridge for high railway loads and it has the right height to use V-shaped piers. Uh, this is somehow unique. There are some bridges like that, but it gives the bridge a very distinct appearance, a light haunch in the middle running out parallel to the uh, top uh, at the sides. Again, an arch bridge, which we have discussed, the bending stiffness of this arch is in the beam. That's a three meter de deep beam, which is the depth of the approach bridge. So the approach bridge, which is some two, three kilometers long, runs through and the arch is one half or less than one half even of uh, the main girder. So we have the uh, contrariety between the small height of the arch and great depth of the beam, which I said before makes for the attractiveness of an arch. Very simple rule, but if you follow that, your arch may always look beautiful. You must not use the same depths for the arch and for the beam. That looks dull. Contrary to uh, the arch bridge we've just seen is the bridge across the Roosevelt Dam in the USA. There, the bending stiffness lies in the arch. Even the lower parts are in concrete because uh, the dam has varying uh, water depths. And so the steel will always be out of the water. This may be in or out. And we have this arch spanning fixed to the sides and a very slender roadway is hung to it. My personal first cable stay bridge, uh, which, I'm, which Leonhard designed and I calculated and did all the details, is the pesco Kennewick Bridge across the Columbia River in the state of Washington uh, in the US. And it appears like a ribbon going over the uh, Columbia River because the fascia, which is about 40 centimeters deep, is inclined to the outside and given a white color. So it catches the sun and the beam underneath, which uh, retracts, 
is hardly visible at all. That is a very beautiful bridge from uh, this point of view, like this, it was said in, in papers, it is like a ribbon. Now, we come to good order. Good or bad order often is seen in trusses. This is a truss where all the diagonals are in parallel, rising and falling by 60 degrees. And even in a skew view, which we have here, there is no inter a visual intersection of uh, the uh, diagonals because they all have the same inclination. The same is true for another railway bridge in Germany, the, at the railway river uh, uh, over the Main River at Nantenbach. It has a main span of 207 uh, meters, which is the longest railway bridge, at least in Germany. But due to the rising and falling diagonals in parallel, it appears light. Even there is no cross frame in the end. It's all in the structure just to upkeep this impression of running over in one go with parallel uh, diagonals. Another example from the other side is the Howrah Bridge, which you will all know very well, in Calcutta, India. It was designed in the 19th century when this was considered necessary and it was it and it was accepted. But the different, many different directions and so on make it from the modern point of view, a uh, structure which is difficult to understand and it looks, uh, le let me say, untidy from our point of view. It was okay, Freeman Fox designed it in the 19th uh, century and it was okay. Today, we have in parallel to that, the Hoogli River Bridge, which is quite, gives the contrast of a one straight beam with the uh, stay cables. And underneath we can see there is just cross girders and main girders. So absolutely, you see the difference from good order, what was considered right, form follows function in the 19th century and uh, today, with the minimum uh, number of, of directions. The arrangement of stay cables forms an important point of view because what distinguishes a cable state bridge from one other by first glance is the tower, the tower shape, and the cable arrangement. And you cannot beat parallel arrangement, fan, uh, harp arrangement of stay cables, especially when they are in one plane, as here for the Overcastle Bridge in. Uh, uh, across the Rhine River. Another good example of parallel harp shaped arrangement has the Hainola Bridge in Finland. Even if seen, as in this case, slightly askew point of view, 
The cables do not intersect visually, but remain in parallel. When I had reviews of my book and I asked an, an architect to help us a lot, also to give a review, not only the uh, uh, engineers I had, without fail, he selected the Hainola Bridge as his favorite bridge. And it looks beautiful. It is a bit more expensive than uh, with the harp arrangement, but it is beautiful. The same is true when we look at uh, the built uh, uh, stone cutter bridge in uh, Hong Kong. We have on one hand the arrangement of cables centering uh, at the tower head, but with one cable plane only, there is no intersection naturally between the two different, the, between the different uh, cables. If we, however, have parallel to have two cable planes in uh, that uh, uh, fan arrangement, then we can de diminish the, the, interse the visual intersection by using an A-shaped tower, which takes the two cable planes together and so uh, the intersections are somehow mitigated. On the other hand, we have the Yangpu Bridge in Shanghai with, I think it's still record span, 602 meters, where there are so many stake cables that they appear like a veil. And so the individual cable is, uh, is back against the veil uh, impression of uh, the many stay cables for such a long span. The, the Baytown Bridge across Houston Ship Channel in, in Texas was considered with two uh, with two beams the most economic solution because the bridge is so wide that just two uh, one beam with two cable planes was uh, too expensive needed too much material and the a towers give a ordered impression However, there is no way around <laughs> that, at least from a bird's eye of view, these uh, backstay cables intersect visually heavily. That has to be, that is a consequence of the bridge uh, construction itself. Now we come to the integration into the environment. The material and scale of the bridge in comparison to its immediate surroundings are the subject of this guideline. An impressive example is the Harvard Bridge South uh, in Berlin. It appears like a unit that there are uh, brownstone uh, buildings and you may not believe it, but this bridge was built much later. The buildings were there and they were the surroundings to which this bridge had to be adapted. And it is what was chosen was that above the piers, these brownstone towers went up, which have only the practical purpose of supporting the lighting 
This is mainly a, a, a pedestrian bridge, so this lighting is uh, important. But by using these brownstone rising piers, which fit the brownstones in the surroundings, we have a good uh, uh, integration of the bridge to its specific environment. Another adaption to the environment is the bridge across the Humboldt Hafen in Berlin, which goes into the main station. Now, the main station is a building from steel and glass with concrete platforms, which are basically the bridge beam running through. And now, from technical point of view, one would have said, well, it's an arch bridge, so we need concrete uh, arches in compression and a steel uh, beam. Not in this case, to be together with the steel uh, architecture there, a steel arch, basically contrary to the normally, was used to achieve a unity to the main station and the bridge. The second part of the older river bridge had to be completed only after German reunification. The first part was built many years before, but only one half of the bridge. Now, today, it would have been much more economic to build the second part, say, by incremental launching or frequented with. But in order to keep the appearance of the existing arch to, with the new one, the new one also was built in arches, which are most fitting to the surroundings of the flat Alder Valley. The Annapolis Bridge in the US, as I said uh, before, is in a curvature, but one had to protect the Annapolis uh, Naval Academy, which is an important part of the US history. And therefore, when there was one of the few competitions, there are not many bridge competitions in the US, the competition was out. We said we must protect the impression of the Naval Academy and not detract the view too much by the bridge. And therefore, we did not use an arch or cable state or something, but just the plane. And all the other competi competitors use something above the bridge, like an arch or like a cable state or something like that. And it so happened that this was accepted by uh, the jury and we won the first prize with our design. One of the earlier cable state bridges is the pedestrian bridge Schillersteg in Stuttgart, 1960 was built. And here was, it's between two, uh, uh, how do we say, two uh, parts of the uh, inner city green belt. And there were originally, you went across the road, was a, a, a way, this way, and that way for pedestrians. And it was taken up in the bridge by bifurcating the end of 
the cable state bridge so that it followed the regular path of the uh, original pedestrian uh, bridge, uh, path. Now we come to choice of materials. The correct selection of materials in regard to the load bearing cap capacity and appearance is important. In general, concrete uh, should be selected for struts and steel for ties. That's rather obvious. Aligning of large areas and piers and abutments with natural stones can be advantageous. Large concrete surfaces can receive a texture from the forms or by chiseling. Large surfaces shall generally be roughened. For small areas, smooth surfaces are appropriate. In accordance with the materials available in 1848, the Ilm River bridge was built from stone. Stone can take no tension, so it has all to be in compression. Now, after uh, redoing the bridge and placing a new top for the uh, on, it serves today in all strengths in the main net of uh, German railways. Built in 1848, about 100, uh, uh, and today, that is uh, a long time, and the bridge is still going strong and is still in use. Timber appears to be an appropriate material for uh, pedestrian bridges like that across the Dame, very close where I live, by the way. <laughs> and you see here the diagonals are in parallel again. And now there is a question of the end portal frame. There, all the wind loads concentrate and have to be taken down into the foundation. And normally, these end frames have are rather heavy, two or three normal diagonal members. And we said, no, we want all the members the same size. So we used a steel frame and we didn't hide it by showing, by uh, uh, using uh, the brownish color in paint, but we made it quite clear, this is a steel frame at the end where the big forces have to be taken. And for that, the steel is appropriate, but we can use about the same sizes for that steel part. The Annapolis Bridge I mentioned before shows ver various uh, materials. The bottom, there is a, a concrete but clad with granite, then goes up in a parabolic way the piers, and they support a certainly lighter. Composite, that means here steel superstructure. There is no cross frame to give that upwards striving impression. This uh, is a true arch where the concrete in compression as uh, stipulated in the beginning, concrete compression, and it takes here the compression force back, and we have a steel uh, main beam 
which is the tensile core. The concrete roadway serves mainly for distributing the wheel loads, but the main part is concrete in compression and steel in tension. Now, the Helgeland Bridge, which is one of my favorite bridges I've uh, done, shows how light a concrete structure can appear. The main force acting on the beam is compression. Therefore, the beam is built from concrete. It has a depth of only 1.25 meters for a main span of 125, uh, 425 meters, which gives a ratio of one in 355. It's very difficult to imagine a concrete structure lighter than this. In another way, the material has been used appropriate for the Flehe Bridge across the Rhine River. For the main span of about 300 meters, steel is used. For the side span, concrete is used, first of all, as a cantilever to tie back the weight, the lesser weight from the steel main span to the heavier concrete side span and uh, then the concrete side span goes on. Naturally, this uh, sundown picture is always impressive for every bridge. Especially as impressive naturally for the Normandy Bridge, which has a main span of, I think, 857 meters, a light steel beam, and it looks very fragile against the sun. It is very difficult to imagine another more simple but still beautiful structure. Was haben wir hier? Ah, okay, that's okay. Now, we come to coloring. An important element for pleasing appearance is the color. Not only steel bridges, but sometimes also concrete bridges are provided with a color so that it fits the surroundings. For large areas, loud colors like shining red or so should be avoided. For the Schatten Bridge in uh, Stuttgart, a light green was chosen to adapt it to the wooded surroundings. The piers are colored in a darker green, which fits then uh, in. This is one of the few but very good examples that you can also color a concrete bridge. This is a, a structure which consists of three parts. It's a small cable stay pedestrian bridge with a V-shaped. It's an open tunnel and the approaches to the cable stay bridge is a truss. Now, basically these are three different structures. But by using the same red for the 
steel parts here, we bind together the assembly of different elements, the tower, the uh, open tunnel, and the approach to the cable state bridge, and it gives a appearance of belonging together just by coloring it the same way. We have here again the uh, uh, arch bridge across the Elbe at Tangermünde. A light white is used for the arch and the, so to say, heaviness of the beam is underlined by giving it a distinct blue color. So it becomes at least in feeling clear, this is just to keep it up, to take the compression and to take the bending, which occurs, the beam is there a strong element. These were the two identical uh, Sarate Brazalago bridges in Argentina. They were the first major railway bridges built in the 70s. And one can see clearly we have a steel beam, which is red, and we have steel diagonals at the tower top, and we have a steel anchor boxes for the towers. All the steel elements are given a red, bright red color, whereas the concrete is shown in its uh, concrete shape and the cables are white. Quite a distinct uh, choice of colors for the different materials. The Mississippi River Bridge at Burlington uses whitish concrete and white cables to give it a in white appearance. This is even further uh, done for the Dee River Bridge in Wales. The tower is from white concrete, precast in this case up, and white cables. So it is uh, a very specific but beautiful appearance. The coloring of cables is always a point where, which is considered in detail. Furthermore, client, the, in this case, the Texas Department of Transportation also wants to have a word in it because Color, everybody thinks he, he has as good an, an opinion as the others. Here it was, the outcome was to give the cables a yellow color. We can see there on the left-hand side, the whole bridge and a detail on the right-hand side. And it shows that the yellow color against the strong blue sky in Texas, strong sun in Texas, gives a good, the right impression. The Rhine River Bridge at Flehe, on the other hand, has a reddish color, red lead, we normally say, is the color which is appropriate when it looks nice. One example which has never been repeated and should not be repeated is the coloring of the towers of the Saint Nazaire bridge. Normally, as a warning against airplanes, warning lights and, and 
uh, give uh, on the top are sufficient. But this was unique, this zebra shaped, and it distinguishes the bridge for all the time from all other cable state bridges. Now, we want to talk about the space above bridge. This is uh, the Karls Bridge in Prague, very famous for its statues. For example, St. Nepomuk, the uh, friend of the uh, bridges and so on. So this is very famous and you can naturally appear very, uh, see very much where, how the bridge runs from this statues. Another modern example I had uh, mentioned already, uh, the, the South Bridge over Havel, where the piers are widened and the, are taken up to carry the lighting standard. And it also marks the sides of the bridge and makes the bridge uh, livable for them who use it. Very often, a bridge goes over a valley and you hardly see that you are on a bridge because there's very little on the sides. But in this way, a bridge is distinctively uh, uh, realizable. This is true for A towers, for the Helgeland Bridge, which we mentioned before, and for a similar bridge in Argentina, we did Posadas Encarnacion. Now, this tent shape of stay cables gives a safe feeling to its users. They feel inside the limitations. Quite different is the case for a cable state design, which was not realized with a center stay cable. We see here from a bird's eye view, it's quite acceptable. However, that is not the normal view we have on a bridge like birds, but we have the view on a bridge from the drivers. And from a driver's view, you, when you approach the stay cables, you just see some pier or pile in the middle and you don't know how, what it really means. All right. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, I have here some, uh, uh, <laughs> we have a little uh, problem with the computer. Okay, okay. So this gives a visual uh, uncertainty and also driving on the sides, this gives the impression, the fear that you may go overboard. I must say, mainly due to this reason, I have never designed a center, a cable state bridge with one cable plane in the center only. It is sometimes okay, there's nothing to say, it, but for me, this disadvantage uh, is important. Now we come to the recognizable, recognizable flow of forces. The on viewer should be able to understand how the forces run. And that is uh, quite exemplary done for the Elbe River Bridge at Torgau, 
we have one haunch where naturally the big force comes down. And to document that further, the pier is clad with granite and it has a different inclination as all the other piers here. So the pier is adjusted to the big force which comes down there and which every, every on viewer, also uh, not an engineer, will uh, recognize and see, aha, there's a big force coming and there it goes in a specially big pier down. The Lever River Bridge is slightly curved and this slight curve has been taken up in an unsymmetric tower. The uh, Tampa and uh, the Sunshine Skyway Bridge is also it is the second of uh, my designs, which has have not been realized, and it still hurts. <laughs> it was in the 1980s that we lost it against uh, Jean Moulin concrete design, and uh, I think it's still beautiful, and we used the same. Uh, considerations we had here for other bridges later. Basically, we have above beam an A, which we know by now is, is favorable, but normally not a straight, he, in this case, not a straight A going down, but taking the two legs together that had to do that we had to have the same footprint as the concrete design. And now when we, here we have only, well, I just, it's just a small technical term, <laughs> compression and bending as, an, as a truss. And down here then it is, we have it in bending. And therefore the depth of the legs, tower legs have to go up. Contrary to, the Baytown Bridge. There we have a double tower, which is connected here at this level. And because it is a truss underneath and above, all the main wind transverse loads are taken in tension and compression. And therefore, the depths of the towers can remain the same. It's actually, it's a 154 meter high tower, I think. And we have 2.1 meters all the way down, very slender. For the Rhine River Bridge at Ilverich, uh, that is close to the Düsseldorf airport, and it was originally designed with tower tips up here and so on. But the airport said, thou shalt not increase your height above this level. And so what was done, so to say, taking it was the tower was so to say cut off and two V shaped towers with a tangent tie there were installed. We need a minimum uh, height here of about one fifth, but with it, with that way out, one could even close to the Dusseldorf airport design a cable state bridge. The Rama 8 bridge in Bangkok shows very clearly how we have here the steel main span and how all the spec stay cables go into one part, which is a heavy concrete part as Kent ledge. So the runner forces from here to there and taken down by dead weight of concrete is clearly visible. 
Another way of showing the runoff forces is a way that we always show how our stay cables are anchored to the beam. We take the anchor head out here, anchor it here in a steel plate, and then it's led into the beam. One could easily use some cladding there and, 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 and hide it, but we do not want to hide, but we want to show how the force comes from the beam, from the beam is through the cable, is anchored here underneath, and then going into the beam uh, itself again. Even more so, as for the usual cables, it is with the backstay cables. The Houston ship channel here, Baytown, has heavy backstay cable forces, so three cables are used. And it's shown here clearly how they run through the steel composite steel beam, anchored here very clearly, and then run back the force into the beam, the horizontal component, and the vertical component is taken up by this pin, pin of one foot diameter, <laughs> it is still called a pin, and taken down and pre-stressed down into the foundation uh, here. So very clear picture, the force ends here, is introduced into the beam, the horizontal force back into the beam, the vertical force down via the pier and post tension. Here it is, uh, it's an architectural design uh, which shows very clearly how this uh, uh, vertical anchoring of the cable forces uh, takes place. Now, when we have series of cable state bridges, which means we have more than one uh, main span, we have to do something to keep up the or to prevent the uh, top of the center uh, stay cable from moving. And one possibility is to tie it down to the next tower or next pier. The cable is double as long as the others, and that shows clearly in the sag here and in the backstay area they intersect visually but that cannot be helped so that is one solution for the tinker use uh, chosen for the tinkau bridge in china another solution for a series of cable state bridges in this case two cable state bridges is chosen here that it is installed a hold down <coughs> a hold down pier in the center to make them again uh, regular. In this case, the, it's a railway bridge across the uh, Orinoco River in Venezuela. All the braking forces, which are important for railways, <coughs> are also taken in this hold down pier, which is therefore sh A shaped. Another example of uh, keeping a tower in place is the Alamillo Bridge in Spain. For permanent loads, this inclination and weight, it's a filled concrete tower, a concrete filled steel tower. The permanent loads are balanced 
But life loads for traffic going across here have to be taken in bending by the tower. Well, that is not the typical way uh, for a cable state bridge to take up the loads. I would not do it, although I accept, uh, this is of course by Calatrava, that it is quite a sculpture. But in my eyes, it's not a cable state bridge. Now, we come to lighting. Aesthetic lighting can enhance uh, bridge appearance at night. Today, the lines of a cable state bridge, be it the cables, be it the towers, are not pointed out by single lights, but it's flood lighted, the towers and the stay cables are flat lighted, like this uh, for the Cap Shuimun bridge in Hong Kong. It's a bluish light which was chosen. For the Nanpu bridge in Shanghai, there was a yellow flat light chosen for all elements above the beam and a bluish light for the space underneath the bridge. The Baytown Bridge is not lit underneath, but on top, the distinct uh, W there is lit by flat light at night. Stonecutter Bridge uh, at night in China gives had this impression. And this is a, a special way. This is the, again the Hainola Bridge, which we mentioned before for the harp arrangement of cables. We have here the sun going the sunset. We have the lighting for the roadway and we have the flat lights for the towers. Quite a unique and, as I think, beautiful arrangement. Now, we come to the conclusion by the catchword simplicity. Above all, simplicity. It's the most important part we have. This is a uh, you may not believe it, but it's a, a railway bridge for heavy railway regular traffic. And we have a very slight beam and very slender towers. One wouldn't expect that to be a railway bridge, but it can be done. You have to uh, try something else. Uh, the Weitingen Bridge I mentioned before, where we have the air struts over the slope valley. When we had the design virtually done, Professor Leonhardt came back one morning and said, ah, we must not obstruct the view through this beautiful Neckar Valley by double towers. We want to use single towers in the middle. And so we designed those single towers, not partly not very happy because we had to redo part of the design, but this is how the bridge was built. You cannot have more simplicity for a 120 meter high tower with a 30 meter wide uh, uh, outer band on top. For arches, also the varying directions can be omitted. Normally, one would use a truss with diagonals, but it can also be done by using uh, hollow sections just over here. And so we avoid that cluttering image with 
a truss on top, but use just the hollow struts. Even, le even less on top, you have with this port bridge in Riza, which has a small span, and any on any uh, on top would have been given a, a wrong impression. So one can make the arches stiff enough to withstand buckling without any uh, on top for small bridges naturally only there. Here we have for the cable state bridge a minimum, four stay, concentrated back stay, and a beam which has a little haunch here. You cannot make that simpler. And finally, uh, one of my favorite bridges, which Professor Leonhard himself designed. It's a pedestrian arch bridge, which has basically only one member, the arch with a light reddish uh, railway. It's hard to beat. There's nothing you can take off. Now, coming to the end. Some words about the architects and engineers, their collaboration. Now, in, in building, the architect is the main actor. He's in the driver's seat. He designs the structure and the engineer makes it stand up, so to say, work. Now, for a bridge, the collaboration is different. For a bridge, engineers are in charge of structure and design and material, and the architect as an advisor can improve quite a bit the appearance, especially when he's in from the beginning. However, it is important that the architect understands what is driving the design, the flow of forces and all of that. I have had it two ways. I have once worked, especially in Sweden, with an architect who just wanted completely different what we thought was appropriate for that, and we finally gave up. On the other hand, we had very good collaboration with architects and Professor Leonhard uh, uh, liked that collaboration with, I like to say, bridge architects. They are not only bridges, they know, but architects who understand what is uh, uh, going on and uh, what the requirements are. Now, against a widespread uh, idea, technical and economical requirements are not contrary to good aesthetics. Sometimes it, it says, okay, 5% for the art, and those, these things are, and it is considered that a beautiful bridge must be more expensive than an ugly one. That is not true. Virtually all the bridges I have shown to you came out of a competition by contractors. And the most economic, which was tendered, was built. So you didn't say this bridge is considered beautiful. It can be 5% more expensive. That is not true. Again, the technical and economic requirements are not 
contrary to good aesthetics. Beautiful bridges are not, expo are not more expensive than ugly ones. They, re they require, however, additional efforts of creativity. So, with that, I want to close. Thank you, Professor Svensson. That was a, a, a pleasure to hear you live again. The yeah. last day of our series. So welcome to have you back and inspire us yet again. Your words uh, give us a lot of food for thought. Your words give us inspiration. Your words have built a whole uh, confidence in us to excel and become better cable state and general bridge engineers. On that note, uh, since you have to leave us early, yes. I won't be taking any questions uh, in the sense that uh, the audience may have some questions which we might take up later. Uh, I just propose a little formal word of thanks to you. So Vikas, could you uh, project the first slide, please? Professor Swenson, Swenson, I have to stop this. Professor Swenson, you may close your presentation. Yes, just a moment. My, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Mr. Kessner is, ah, here we are. Yeah. Okay. If you can. Uh, so I see you now just, full and clear. Yeah. So let me just uh, propose. Uh, Vikas, can you show the uh, slide, please? Uh, what? Yeah, just what's... a moment. Uh, it is yeah, just full screen, full screen. Yeah. It, it is a, a token of our appreciation, sir, since we can't physically be there with you and give you a hug. Mon, mon, many of us would simply like to give you a hug of appreciation and shake your hand and get your blessings. So true guru always gives his blessing to his students. You know, in the old Indian way of working, you have a guru and the guru gives you his knowledge and we are all his shishyas or his students. And we sit around and we gain knowledge from the wise one, which is the guru. So in this case, to our guru, Holger Svensson, a token of our sincere appreciation and gratitude, a small token of the dancing Nataraja pose, very famous in Hindu mythology, which we mm -hmm. will send you a note about when we send you the present. So this present as a memento, you will have to wait for a few days. It will come to you by courier. Uh, and it's a present from the Indian Association of Structural Engineers on October 2020 in sincere gratitude to you, sir. Most grateful. And from our association, I'm sure Alok would like to say a few words, our president. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Harsha. And this memento is for Professor Holger Svensson with lots and lots of love and affection from all of us. Uh, I just wanted to mention that today is a, a very special day for all of us uh, because we are at the concluding session of an extremely uh, successful course, you know, on cable state bridges, uh, which we have conducted uh, from 5th of September when we first had our uh, first interaction with Professor Holger Svensson. Sir, I can tell you one thing that no other uh, CPD course in the past that Indian Association of Structural Engineers has you know, uh, uh, conducted, has received so much of uh, appreciation and attention from the participants as this one. I mean, the participants in this case were fascinated, particularly by the manner in which the lectures are prepared and presented by you, sir. I mean, the lectures have shown the passion and enthusiasm for the subject that you have. And it seems that you are enjoying every uh, delivery of your lecture. And that <laughs> itself has shown so much of warmth, you know. <laughs> so, I, in fact, I will just share with you, some of our senior colleagues of my age have mentioned that they envy you, they envy the young who are privileged enough to listen to these lectures and have the uh, opportunity to implement these in a lifetime. And probably many of <laughs> us may not have this opportunity. So they envy this young generation. Uh, uh, we are very uh, fortunate that, uh, you know, uh, we have closed, I mean, very successful lecture today. We will be ending. Thank you so much for this fabulously great series of 
30 lectures that you have given us and this has inspired us to a great deal and i we were discussing in the just before the lecture that we are in the process of now finalizing the guideline for cable straight bridges and a uh, lot of inputs we have already uh, taken from your lectures and your books and uh, once we bring it to some shape we will be also uh, uh, getting your advice we will be sending you that document i on behalf of all the participants and all the uh, members of association express once again our deep gratitude to you sir we remain your student any time you have to come to india you are our guest thank you sir thank you thank Alok. you very thank dr. you dr harsha with you yeah i will uh, so it is uh, gentlemen ladies and gentlemen the audience fellow bridge engineers let me for this brief moment say uh, it is my pleasant duty to propose a formal vote of thanks to the guru on on behalf of our ia structi our indian association of structural engineers words are insufficient to express our sincere gratitude to professor swenson for permitting us to share his unique and phenomenal recorded lecture series based on his book cable state bridges 40 years of experience worldwide this course has greatly enriched our participants by furthering their professional development and inspiring them to take on with confidence challenging cable state bridges in india and elsewhere this is for us to you sir with sincere appreciation and love thank you for being our guru and uh, we wish you well we wish your family well and pleasant days ahead and keep on sharing your knowledge as you've done and we will hopefully hear from you again uh, on another maybe another note on another lecture series on something different because we truly enjoyed being with you it's as though we were sitting in your classroom all along <laughs> well thank you very much for your kind words from everybody uh, talking and i feel especially honored by being called guru by an indian audience so i'm looking forward to receive that and it was my pleasure to give you these lectures basically it's what i do at uh, university but this time of the year there are no present uh, lectures i my students also have to do the same to read by to learn by by computer and i give them uh, questions and an answer so to say all two weeks again I enjoyed very much talking to you and listening to you. Uh, it was my pleasure, and I remain sincerely yours, Guru Venson. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful, sir! Wonderful, wonderful! Thank wonderful, you, wonderful. wonderful. Well said, sir. Thank you, sir. We should take a two-minute break, but before that, I also want to tell you, Professor Venson, we have a great friendship with your country. Uh, some of us have a few generations of friendship with us yes. uh, professor tand and myself we know professor yeah. like and mike very yeah. well we have worked together and you might not know but my professor my father my late father got a conferred phd from the university of stuttgart which was mm. quite exemplary that's so, where i, I mean, do have very deep ties with your country and we hope to further these ties through you again thank, thank you, you sir thank you thank you thank you guru thank you right let's take a 2 minute break and then we'll get back to the last lecture and uh, then i take it to thank you sir we we'll take a 2 minute break because thank you thank, thank you. you sir thank you thank you okay i don't can we then abschalten jetzt die sehen mich scheint's immer noch Two minute break and back for the ship impact lecture please 2 minute break
We'll start in one minute. So I request you all to take your seats and Uh, Vikas, um, shall we start, please? Vikas? Vikas. Where is, I think Vikas... Uh... Action is gone. He'll come back. I yes. think by the time Vikas comes back, you can take some, perhaps uh, we, uh, in the panel discussion, we can do something. Right. Uh, right. Uh, can I uh, read uh, something for the panel or shall we start with the views of uh, Max? Would you like to say something, Max? Max, are you available? Professor Tandon? Max, go yeah, ahead. I'm, I'm Max, available, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, Max, go ahead. The... Yeah, okay. So, uh, yeah, it was uh, interesting. Uh, it was, of course, not just about the aesthetics of uh, cable stay bridges. It was about the aesthetics of uh, bridges in general. And uh, so uh, I would say one of the very interesting comments in the beginning was uh, the uh, uh, comment he made about uh, the form uh, leading to uh, form and function, isn't it? Form uh, gives the function. And uh, I would form indeed- follows, uh, Form follows function. Uh, form, form follows function, exactly. I would uh, rather say that uh, uh, form which permits direct efficient load paths will, uh, from my point of view, will always result in beautiful bridges. I would uh, formulate like that. Now we're uh, going to the cable stay bridges. I think, uh, or first general, I would say aesthetics. There are uh, two aspects, the aesthetics for people looking at the bridge from uh, the ground, from below or whatever, and then uh, the experience of people driving over a bridge. It's uh, two different things. So the, the first one, uh, if you look now uh, uh, with regard to cable state bridges, so uh, uh, let's start uh, for uh, the experience for the driver. So cable state bridges together with suspension bridges and uh, maybe arch bridges, which arch is above, the decks are the only type of bridges where you really uh, realize you uh, on you drive on the road that you uh, cross a bridge, right? Many bridges, you don't really realize that you're on a bridge, right? So uh, that is already, of course, uh, giving a special experience. Now, uh, uh, he was mentioning that uh, uh, single planes of stays is not such a, a nice experience compared to a double plane of stays. Uh, I'm not so sure about that one. I think single plane of stays uh, can also uh, uh, be nice. Uh, you take a Sunshine -Sun Skyway bridge, which is a, has long approach spans, and uh, uh, you are, which are in a curve. So uh, before you reach the main crossing, you have a, a chance to look at the bridge, uh, literally, and uh, you appreciate uh, the structure. And uh, once you are on the bridge, and uh, you are then. Uh, having only uh, a line sort of, of pylon and stays, uh, you know what this whole thing is about. So stay cable, I think uh, he uh, made it quite clear uh, that uh, it's all a lot about uh, pylons. Uh, it's about pylon shape, it's about the uh, stay uh, uh, arrangements. So uh, uh, I think, uh, if you have single plane of stays, that's uh, easier to arrange. I think uh, you can there have a, a fine type arrangement. You can have hard type arrangement. Both is possible. 
if you have two planes of space, if they are parallel planes, then uh, you have seen the example from Finland, uh, you get beautiful structures if the planes, uh, if the stays uh, have a hard type arrangement. Now, uh, if you incline uh, uh, planes of stays, then, uh, and you anchor in uh, uh, at the top of a, a pylon or of a diamond shaped pylon, then uh, uh, this is uh, uh, definitely aesthetically better than uh, if you have uh, parallel planes with uh, uh, fan type uh, uh, stay around. Uh, yeah, so uh, uh, he also talked about uh, uh, things like uh, uh, lighting. And uh, you have, of course, uh, today you have also option to, uh, to install uh, LED lights on the stays itself, right? So uh, there are some examples where uh, LED lights along uh, stays, uh, you have then the option to play around with uh, uh, the colors. You can even use the uh, plane of stays as a kind of an outdoor screen to display uh, maybe a message or to display some, uh, some pictures. Yeah, so uh, I think it was interesting and uh, uh, overall gave uh, a nice, a nice uh, view about uh, aesthetics. And then uh, he ended, I think, with uh, the comment that uh, you don't really pay more uh, for a good looking uh, bridge. Provided you uh, you uh, co incorporate this uh, kind of considerations from the very beginning. Very true, very true. Alok, shall we? If you've got it, shall we go ahead, Alok, or shall we wait for Vikas? Yeah, yeah, we can go ahead. We can I go ahead now. Yeah, let us keep the audience uh, with this event uh, going. So let us uh, go. If you can start. Yeah, I can start now. Go ahead. Just bear with us a minute. We are trying to just transfer the control. Uh, just bear with us a minute. No, Alok, we have difficulty. No, it's not showing. So. Harsha, are yeah. you able to see the video? No. No. Oh. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I thought I'm running the video. Just a minute. Just can okay. you give me time with me? Okay. Is the lecture visible? 29. 28. Yeah. Play. 28. Yeah, play. Lecture number 28. Yeah, that's right. It's there. Oh, not clear, Rallo. The audio is not coming. Uh, we will deal with it. Just two minutes. It's not clear? It's not clear? <coughs> not clear. No, nothing is coming. Mm, we are not oh. hearing. Kuch nahi aara. Just one moment. 
अभी आया नहीं है मैं दोबारा करता हूँ लेट मी ट्राई ट्राई अगेन प्लीज Just bear with us. Uh... Now, oh, screen was coming. I think just go go. to the next slide. Then only then we'll know. Just play. Yeah. Uh, play. Play. Pause. Stop. Am I going? No, you might have to change your audio setting. You are not able to visit to see the lecture, is it? We can see him speak, but we can't hear coherently. Voice is not coherent; it's muffled. Maybe the audio setting. Maybe audio video setting has to be changed. Just a minute. Just a minute. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so that is not going to happen from my side okay oh. i don't know how to play now hello uh, maybe some problem with 28 29 chal raha hai ki nahi dekh lo aap 29 30 over there i don't know sir ek chalega to chalenge ha because 28 was 29 30 hai to hello when you play maybe some audio video clash is there ha uh, maybe maybe ha uh, let us see Twenty nine, twenty thirty years. Is it visible now? Right. All, 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 all the the player. Lecture. Open it with the VLC player. Please try to. Are you able to see the lecture twenty eight? No. We are seeing your screen. VLC players, what is this VLC player work? Yeah, Vikas. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, Vikas, go ahead. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Just take, take host. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, sorry for this little glitch. Uh, thank God it happened when Professor Swenson was uh, finished his talk. <laughs> it would have been a disaster. Okay, I think. Gone. I think Vikas has gone. But Vikas will is back, and we are back on Vikas air. Has been. on this important uh, topic uh, go ahead Vikas. we have now completed uh, our okay. review of the different types of cable stayed bridges and for the remaining three lectures one today and two in a fortnight we have three separate special themes The first one I will deal with now is on the protection of bridges against ship collision. And next time the first one will be on in short bridge aesthetics, guidelines for the aesthetic design of bridges. And the last one I will tell you about my 40 years of experience with cable stayed and other major bridges all over the world as a fitting closure and i 
guarantee you we will not uh, have an exam on uh, the last uh, lecture with that experience. By the way, um, there are examinations coming up and thank God there are now for you to look at already two. The first ones had none at all, but still I will do my own uh, exam preparation uh, one morning, three hours or four hours. Uh, Mr. Depe will give you the date where I will give you in the shape of the examination a repetition of what we've done and I assure you there will be nothing in the exam which we have not dealt with in the preparation. I think it's a little bit too much asked of you that you shall know by heart thousand pages of script. So uh, we will concentrate on the main items which can be uh, checked and my experience I've now taken two exams, I mean for me also the first time, on the other, I was always sitting on the other side of the table. <laughs> but the result was that there were good, good uh, uh, results and I was quite happy that people somehow understood. But uh, I know the pressures, I mean I've been studying myself, so I think I, that's why I do the preparation for the examination myself. You will get that well, you can load it down uh, from the internet to t take with you and make some Thanks. notes. And then I assure you, if you are fairly sober in that morning of the test, you should be able to do it. Okay, Mr. Depe will give you the dates. Now, on the protection of bridges against ship collision. Uh, We'll deal it in some general notes. Then the main item, what are the impact forces? We have to know. And then what can we do against by uh, discussing protective structures and a little summary. Now, we are talking about a real hazard. It's a real danger. It's not some theory where in the ultimate limit state we assume if we use a factor of this then it will fall down. No, it happens, riches have fallen down and many people killed. Just this little list here it comes to about 300 people killed and uh, I mean that's a considerable number. Uh, I've been involved with some myself, one uh, is the, uh, where is it? The Sunshine Skyway, somewhere in the 1980. There it is. Okay. Sunshine Skyway Bridge. I've shown you our composite bridge uh, we had designed. The reason was why we had to design it, the bridge came down, and there were drivers, it was in, in, a, in, a, in a rainstorm and there were several cars who dropped down, plus a bus with many people. So that came to 35 lives. Of course there are uh, even worse ones, but that's one I was involved with. And so we are really talking about something which is not just theory. It happens. And it's Murphy's Law. What can go wrong, goes wrong. I mean, we have all the, the probability curves and what have you. I tell you, if a pier can be reached by a ship, it will be reached. Because the main reason for these accidents still is that uh, at the steering wheel, the guy is blind drunk all the beautiful theory what you have with probability and things people are drunk at the, at, the, at the wheel and when they are drunk it doesn't matter whether they pass off this or this or this so Murphy's law you have to take into account what is reachable will be reached 
It has quite an economic uh, impact even when you design new bridges. Because the cost per pier, we will see that in detail, I'll just give it in general, to make it safe against the ship impact can be very, very high. Now, we know already when the piers become more expensive, it's more economic overall to have greater span lengths. Whether the piers are expensive because they are 200 meters high or whether they have to be made strong against ship impact doesn't matter. Money is the same. So, very early in a bridge design we have to take into account what ship impact do we have, what sizes of ship, what does it cost, and then we have, a main, a span, over uh, water, we have a minimum span length, which is the navigational clearance sh the ships require for regular passage. However, what may be the difference in cost if we, so to say, voluntarily widen the span length, thus increasing the cost for the main span, the cost per square meter goes up with main span. I think that's obvious. But save may be more in not having to reinforce the foundations against ship impact. That's an offset. And recently when we were designing the bridge alternate for the Fehmarn crossing across the Baltic Sea, the main bridge, this was a main item and they had very high forces there, Pedersen, you will see. And so the design was quite a bit driven by ship impact uh, conditions right in the middle of the Baltic Sea, just as one example. So we have to take this very seriously. Uh, the main item, of course, we want to know what are the forces we have to design the pier against. When I came to this business in the early 80s because of the uh, Sarate Brasilargo bridges in Argentina, we'll see an example, I looked into the literature and found there's nothing, virtually nothing. Uh, there was uh, Minoski who did for if two ships run into one another, he calculated a, a force which is proportional to the volume of the deformed steel which may be very nice for shipbuilders, but we poor engineers <laughs> can't do much with that. There was nothing. And so, uh, as a typical example, I take the collision Newport for, of the Newport Bridge, Rhode Island. We see here the heavily deformed bow of the ship. And we see here the, well, slightly spelled a uh, damaged pier of the Newport Bridge, that's a major suspension bridge. Very sturdy piers. Okay, the bridge survived, the ship at least didn't go down. And now, for this typical situation, a steel pier which can have plastic deformations and a very rigid pier, uh, we'd like to know the impact forces. There was nothing. It so happened that I came up on publications in my hometown, Gestacht, near Hamburg, where uh, the um, atomic power ship Otto Hahn was designed. At that time, in the 60s, I think, they wanted to have commercial ships uh, with uh, atomic power stations. Didn't work out later, but anyway. And so, for these atomic ships, one had to design some protection for this uh, atomic power station. And so there were tests made uh, by a Mr. Voisin, who I got to know very well, at the Hobaltswerft, I think, in Hamburg, with models. You see the man here, and those were heavy, uh, expensive models, and they were let down an inclined plane with a given speed, and the impact forces were measured. Lots of publications. And something like that always came out. There's first a fluctuation 
a very, very short period. Basically, I say that's the pre-buckling, before the thing buckles and so on, it stiffens up, but it's very short. And then we have, for a longer period of time, we have the average force. And that's where we all decided, yes, that's only a dynamic effect. We have to design for the average force. How big is the average force? And then, with my simple mind, I looked into the results and, and s sketched something and came up with the relation that the impact force is proportional to the ship size, dead weight tonnage. Measured in dead weight tonnage, simple, with some factor there. Uh, and that was it. And then I said, okay, we, we use this formula. And then, of course, we need, we have a certain scatter. Because it depends on the make of the bow of a ship, whether it's very stiff. Take a, a, a warship, a very stiff bow. Or whether it's very soft, say an oil tanker. And so we said, from all these tests and what have you, and Mr. Voisin, who was a ship engineer, helped me there a lot. Uh, we said, okay, this plus minus 50%, depending on the type of ship. Beautiful. And that gave the first hand of the risk, uh, first formula to give something. And uh, then we worked together in the United States on, on, on HTO. I was on the HTO committees and so on. And my good friend Mike Knott uh, became in charge. And then they said, ah, well, this plus minus 50%, that's all too difficult. We use the 70% uh, fractile. And then uh, we have that all well covered. I don't believe it, but OK, it's easier to calculate. I agree. And so then the formula became 0.98 instead of 0.88 uh, dead weight tonnage, which is basically the H2 formula. And there are uh, other formulas taking into account the speed. The speed of the ship has a little influence. Not very much, because the bigger the impact force for a given ship, the longer is the plastic area of deformation. The work which has to be done, there is kinetic energy which has to be killed by inner work of plastifying the steel. So it's not that you have always the same two meters plastified, uh, in the, uh, uh, whatever the speed is and high forces, you know, weigh times labor is the weight times the force, but it's normally you have a constant force depending on the uh, crushing or uh, plastic deformation resistance times the way. That's the inner work which has to take up the kinetic energy, one half mv square of the ship, plus five percent uh, water you have to take into account which runs with the ship. But not going into details. So this was then done, uh, what, what I had found, we put basically into H2. We have here the force versus time. Uh, the Euro code, the old Euro code, I have to say, used the same, basically. And then uh, Mr. Pedersen came up, I think 1983, who made some theoretical calculations, and he came up with double. So there's a big discussion today. Who's right? Eshto or Pedersen? And as usual, people are careful. Eurocode, the old Eurocode, switched from what we did for Eshto to Pedersen. Uh, so it's open to discussion. And you have to read the tender documents for the ship very carefully and looking out what impact forces do I have to assume for the given ship and so on. Do I have to use Pedersen or do I have to have Eshto? That's quite a difference in cost. So it's uh, not nice, but that's what the situation is. I can't 
keep that as a secret. Now, what is the truth? Pontius Pilate said in the Bible, what is truth? In this case, we don't know, but we can try with finite element simulations. And there I came across something uh, at the Tongji University at Shanghai, where I know the head of engineering very well, and he gave me that. And they made uh, finite element uh, collisions with a real ship's bow formed and all these things. And this is what, over the time, what uh, uh, Tongji University came up with, which I'm quite satisfied is good enough in the range of the formula we made for Ashto and think Pedersen is too high. Of course I'm biased, you know that. Uh, what Tongji did, they f uh, modeled this type of ship's bow with all the decks and everything and they modeled the bridge pier, and that was the outcome, looks mm, not unreasonable to me. Now they evaluated that for other things. They said, for example, well, good enough if we have a real solid wall, what I showed you, Rhode Island Bridge. But normally, the piers are a little bit flexible. And what happens now if we have an additional parameter flexible piers instead of rigid. Okay, here we see. A rigid wall would give these forces over the time and a certain flexible piers at the pile cap would give, well, in the peak, half of that. So it's quite important if you want to reduce the forces to take into account flexibility of the foundation, especially, of course, if you are on high piles. If you have a solid pier on rock, not much giving. But if, if it's on long piles, it helps. Mm -hmm. Every little bit helps to keep the price down to win the competition. That's the name of the game we are talking here. <laughs> uh, then the other thing which I briefly indicated in the beginning, the time period we have here uh, one local peak. Then we have a local mean peak. And then we have a mean over time, a general. We decided basically at that time we use the mean over time. And you see already, and then you say, ah, no good, we use the peak. Then you are where Peterson is against what, what, what we have. So it's open to, to interpretation. And if you compare then, uh, take impact velocity into account for collision forces, and see the difference between the absolute peak, the local mean peep, peak, and the global mean peak, there's already a factor two in. And then if you say, okay, old Euro code and HTO and compare all that, well, I would say if taking into, into account that we don't know what type of ship is hitting there and all that, uh, it gives us at least an idea what forces to apply and it has to be specifically stated in the tender documents. Now, once we have established, in a way, uh, the impact forces, then of course there come in all the probabilities and things like that. I'm not going into that. That's in, for example, HTO and uh, other codes. What can we do about it? How do we protect our bridge against the consequences of ship collision? First of all, highly recommended place the bridge and the piers out of reach. If the bridge, ca if the, the ship can't reach the bridge, it can't do, it cannot do any harm. Simple, isn't it? <laughs> so, an example, uh, the old Tjern bridge in Sweden, an arch bridge, oh, 278 meters, nice. However, uh, a ship could reach the arch where it came, where it, the arch comes down. Well, 
That's the old turn bridge. And in accordance with Murphy's law, what can happen happens. There was a ship running into the arch and taking the whole ship down. No. Okay, now we've learned that. So we place the new bridge out of reach. We use a cable state bridge with piers safely on land and you see that the same uh, ship cannot reach any part. This is the new Tjern bridge done by Krupp. Our alternate wasn't successful. Another of our bridges, second Panama Canal bridge, of course a bridge across the Panama Canal. There's the one and only overriding consideration thou shalt not hinder the ships in the canal. Any, nothing else interests the people who run the canal who pay for the bridge. Okay, so it's very high, very far away or far away from and even far away that the widening of the Panama Canal, which is currently under work, can be taken up easily. So high enough, wide enough, no ship in the Panama Canal can reach the bridge. Yangpu Bridge, Shanghai, it was world record 602 meters in 1994 when I was checking that for the World Bank. The 602 meters came up from the condition no ship must be able to reach the bridge. We want it not out of the navigational channel. Think of the drunken sailor. Out of the water. <laughs> no. So that's where the 602 meters came from and we see here uh, the foundations being built with uh, also a little seawall against that was it. Stonecutter, not the one you know but our design which came up second, it still hurts, we w <laughs> would have liked to do that, it's a nice bridge. Uh, uh, looks we had there uh, also was a condition you can put it ashore close to the shore but not uh, in it is on piles okay now what happens if a ship runs into the seawall well you can do it with finite elements and you find uh, um, a certain force being exerted through the soil, say seawall, onto the foundation. It's nothing really serious, but it had to be shown, it was in the tender documents, so it was investigated. Portsmouth, south of England, they wanted to build a viewing tower. And we, we were the engineers with the architect there and won the competition. And of course, uh, the, all the big uh, sail competitions. The idea was to make to to have a sail a ship's shale, sail uh, reflected in there with the platforms and all that. Well, it had to be more or less in the water, so it could be reached by ships, and especially there are some ferries running to and fro, and even if a ferry loses its steering wheel or engine power and dr is drifting under the wind, ferries are high, we don't like that. And the, Now what was done then was okay, we make an independent protection uh, in front here which can uh, deflect and make this sort of a, of a buffer. So even for a building, that's why I brought it here, uh, it may be necessary if it can be reached by ship, uh, we have to protect it. So out of reach, we put the foundation out of reach but with an uh, artificial structure. The next possibility are artificial islands. If we can't put it on land, then let's put the land around it, if possible. Here is an example, Houston Ship Channel Crossing, you've seen that in detail. 
uh, it was possible to place this artificial island around. Uh, it works very nicely. Uh, if you put riprap stones on top, it holds for a long time. The difficulty can be if the water is too deep. You have to use a lot, with an inclination, a lot of, of material, plus you reduce the cross-section of flow in such a way that, naturally that's all proportional, uh, if you reduce the cross-section, the speed, the water speed goes higher, and so you may create an additional hazard by increasing the speed, plus it's hard to keep the gravel sandstone in place. So that's the shortcoming. But, but if it's rather shallow, the water, uh, it's a reasonable solution. We see it here for Sunshine Skyway, or you see it here for the Kap Shui Mun bridge in Hong Kong. Uh, that's an artificial island. We can also try to guide the ship away. If it's going in the direction of the pier, we can use a guide structure to, to guide it away. Not frontal blow, but guide it. One example is the Kronprinzen Bridge in uh, Berlin. Behind there is the new uh, main station. Calatrava design, very nice, very involved. However, it so happened that during the design they forgot all about them ships which run underneath the bridge. So if Calatrava won his bridge and won the design, the bridge was built, and only then people said, what the hell, we have these big ships running there on the spray. Uh, remember uh, the first arch bridge I showed you, and these arches can definitely be reached by a ship. So, well, we make some guide structures, yes, very nice. The result was we have nearly as much steel in the guide structures as in the bridge. If they would have considered from the beginning and defined this must not uh, be, be uh, there must be no structure in this part, beautiful. But they forgot all about it. We're all excited about Calatrava's beauty and so they had to pay, pay for it later. But it's not yet come down and so far uh, that's a consolation. Uh, another example, Neckar Bridge uh, in Germany, there was a redesign and people were aware that I mean there are not ocean-going ships on the Neckar River believe me but uh, enough uh, that you if they run in to take to take the pier away there and so there were some guide structures installed decreasing from I think 20 to 12 meters uh, the navigational clearance but Okay, so that was an example, and in the final stage then, when all was said and done, we have the strong, nice piers, and they can take a hit from those Necker boats uh, which run there. All very scientific, don't laugh. Uh, of course, now we come to independent protections. Some t um, basically, It is helpful that we have the load from the weight of the bridge on the piers against we have a hit, I mean this vertical compression always helps to take up a moment, I think that's perfectly clear. But uh, sometimes it doesn't help, very bad foundation conditions. We have, we can't make it wide enough and so we have to make, we can't make it strong enough, we have to make an independent protection. Sarate uh, Brasolargo bridges, I've mentioned those near Argentina, uh, across the Parana. We've done several bridges there, I've mentioned that. Um, after the bridge was long done, the 
uh, authority said, ah, we've forgotten all about ship collision. So it was tendered, and that was for me the reason to start and work on this 1980-82 ship collision thing and, and try to find out something. And so what came out after I had determined impact forces and things which wasn't there, said, okay, we need something strong, we can't, the bridge is done, we cannot reinforce that. Uh, so we said, okay, we use on piles, bad foundations, we use a circular concrete pile with a, a deflecting top, which if the ship ramps here, takes it away, and we use some timber fenders for the smaller boats and all very nicely considered, and the contractor, with whom, for whom we designed the original bridge, check in. They put a price on and everybody seemed to be happy, except that the state said, ah, oh, wow, well, that's much too expensive. And they used then floating protections. That's what is in there, uh, which I call is an administrative protection, but I have not much trust in floating uh, uh, protections. To start with, if you don't have a very uh, special sort of bulbous bow, if you have a raking bow or pontoon, those will just run over this floating protection. Plus, it's very difficult to inspect the moorings at the bottom of the river and all that. So, I, I say I take uh, no good, but they had something in the books and said, we've done something for uh, impact protection, but it doesn't work. Now, here, what I mentioned, here we have an example, Sunshine Skyway Bridge, Tampa, Florida, where originally there were two superstructures like this, and during a rainstorm, a ship, phosphate freighter, ran against in, in this, into this pier, the pier can came down, the second bridge half came down, and there were several drivers on the bridge in their cars which came down, plus the bus, I told you. 35 lives lost, 1980, uh, and then a new bridge was built. Uh, I showed you uh, that unfortunately our design, steel composite, lost against Jean Muller's concrete alternate, and that's his concrete alternate. However, we were then involved, it was just uh, after the uh, Sarate uh, Brasilargo investigation, with Mike Knott, I worked, who were, made then the Eshto, and of course, since this was a bridge which was coarse, by a ship collision and 35 lives. The protection against ship collision for the new bridge was taken very seriously. No administrative protection here. And we used what we call in the US uh, belts and suspenders. So we did it uh, in two ways. First of all, the main to the towers were uh, receive protective islands and the side span piers received dolphin protection and then for good measure for the main towers in addition to the artificial island there was also a major dolphin. Now this hopefully will prevent another downfall and we did the dolphin similarly as I had originally considered for the Sarate bridges here we have good gravel on the bottom of Tampa Bay, so we don't need piles, but otherwise uh, it's, it's uh, sheet piles basically with a concrete top filled with lean mixed concrete, timber fenders around, and uh, that was something like 85, and nothing happened, thank God, to the bridge since then. Rosario Victoria in Argentina, across the Parana, 350 meters. We see here already independent protections. 
It's the same river in Argentina where the Sarate bridges were, where they had the floating protection, which I don't like. Now here we have this situation. That was mwah, at the end of the design required. We worked there for contractors, Hochtief and others. This is the bridge. Upstream, downstream, that's the design ship with a given speed and all that. And it was not possible anymore because we have here 60 meter deep piles to make the bridge itself strong enough. So we had independent protections, although they are missing the vertical load from the bridge itself, as I mentioned, but couldn't be helped. And that's uh, a pile cap, concrete pile cap, bigger upstream, lower downstream, because the speed of the ship against the current is smaller than coming down. And uh, we used, uh, we see it here, that's an uh, enlargement. This thing, they were then installed and they work by plastic hinges in the steel pipes. So again, kinetic energy of the ship, one half mv square plus five percent of water, has to be taken up by internal work, which is basically if we use rotational hinges, the rotational resistance times the angle. Which means if I have an angle here, I need quite some way between, uh, you see this has to be considerable to enable that uh, plastic hinges are formed in the steel pipes. Well, that was all taken into account. And then the steel pipes were filled with sand, uh, which increases their buckling capacity. Uh, if you try to bend a hollow steel pipe, it will somehow buckle. And you do not get the full theoretical plastic capacity. However, if you fill it, say, with sand, it cannot buckle and you can develop. So, there were all these tests made and so we proved that the kinetic energy of the ship can be taken by internal plastic work. Ship collisions can take very well place with the side spans as well as the main spans. Think of the drunken sailor. Uh, so the uh, keel bridge I showed you in, in uh, formerly, where the pier is rather on the side, has upstream a rather solid protection, uh, which basically has to be on piles with a pile cap to take the force of a Rhine River ship. Second Orinoco Bridge, Venezuela, I showed you. Uh, similar problems as in Paraná. Long piles, 10 meters uh, tied up and down. So, sort of independent protection. You see, it's not connected because we have these deep piles. Independent connection around the piers the bridge is done to the best of my knowledge. This is not installed. Hugo Chavez is a little bit short of money currently, so hopefully uh, later it will be paid for the time being the bridge is vulnerable against ship impact. So finally, uh, we can strengthen the piers. If everything else fails or if that is the most advantageous, we don't take it out of the water, we don't have protective structures, uh, we just make it strong. And one interesting example is the Galata Bridge in Istanbul. Everybody of you who has been in Istanbul has gone across the Galata Bridge. That's just in the center of the bridge. And from I don't know, hundreds of years, there was a floating bridge because it's very bad soils conditions. And uh, we were the first ones with Tussen mainly, Tussen Krupp, to design a fixed bridge there, the Galata Bridge. That's our design uh, there. It is, I have not uh, mentioned, it is a movable bridge. 
uh, it's not very a Bescure bridge. It's not very often opened, but uh, it has to be open, especially because uh, warships are lying here and the army or the navy, better said, insists you can get in and out. And so uh, we have the problems of the very deep piles. Of course, we have the Bescure bridge. We have heavy earthquake. And we have ship collision from these warships going in and out. And uh, would you have a look? Is this Yeah. Now cut. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so these are contrasting requirements. For earthquake, we want it flexible so that it, you know, isn't stiff and, and it takes the forces of an earthquake. Uh, for ship, ship collision, it has to be strong, it has to resist. And um, there was then a compromise found, and I remember Dr. Kovac, who did all the dynamics for me here, did the design and we discussed it and he had beautiful uh, animations where he showed what happened during an earthquake for this design and how can it take ship impact. So it was a compromise between the contradiction flexible against earthquake and strong, sturdy, against uh, ship collision. In addition, uh, it was said, well, I mean, the bridge is low over water, and what happens if, say, a warship or major ferry warship runs into the beam, not hits the piers, but runs into the beam. And then the requirement was that you don't have that these side flaps don't fall down and so there was then assumed that uh, this here the, the ship hits the lock in the middle where the two bascules meet gives up slides out and this remains and it was shown that this is also at least stable so the whole bridge didn't collapse but uh, only this part. That was in addition, that's an additional story how to protect the superstructure or the beam of a bridge against high standing up uh, parts of a ship. The Elgeland Bridge, I showed you 30 meter deep waters, uh, deep water on rock, precast. Uh, boxes filled with concrete strong enough that the ships which are expected in that fjord in Norway can run against. Similar the Ödevalla bridge in Sweden uh, we have here uh, so to say high high water this is out of the water but that's in and if we look the is low water the one which we, uh, we have just seen is this one where the water is higher and you see there is nothing particular there's just the pile cap and uh, we calculated that this type of foundation on rock and so on can take the impact force from the ship to be expected there. Now to sum it up The problem of ships colliding with bridges is very real. History shows that regularly, definitely every year, I'm not saying every month, although worldwide maybe every month, ships collide with bridges and often it costs lives. 
And if sometimes you're less more sensitive, you will find sometimes it makes it into the news, especially when there are more than several dead. It regularly is a news feature from all over the world. So it's a real danger, not just for, for cost, but for lives. And we have to be careful to make sure it doesn't happen. Also, it can have an important impact on the design of the bridge because if a pier in the deep water is very expensive it may, uh, to protect against ship collision, it may be overall more economic to widen the span and gain from less costs in the piers against more costs in the beam. That is very real and if you have, if you design bridges, not just the Neckar River, I mean that's not really uh, the good example, but say the Baltic Sea. Right across the Baltic Sea where you have big sea going ships, uh, it can influence the design and if you forget it, well, your design will probably not win because in the end it's too expensive. So remember ship collision from the very beginning, if possible. Then the main and first issue is how big are the forces which are exerted by a colliding ship onto, say, the bridge pier. And from tests with sizable ship models, a formula has derived its uh, the force is proportional to the weight size of the ship measured in dead weight tonnage which is worldwide accepted. The factor in front of the square root is a little bit subject to discussion uh, as I've shown you there's a factor of two uh, but uh, there are also finite element investigations which I would say these days should be done for all specific cases, not go by this rule of thumb formula, which is rather rough, I mean it's to give you an idea. But try to model the ship which uh, uh, you have to, which is running off enough, try to model the pier, also its supports, to get some, and then find out what forces, say, reach the foundation, the pier cap, and for that you try to design. And remember, do not be misled by these beautiful probability functions. The further away from the main span, the less the risk. Murphy's Law and the drunken sailor, remember. <laughs> so. Uh, then what can we do to mitigate the results of a collision or to avoid a collision? First of all, the best is put the piers on land unreachable for ships, if possible. Then uh, uh, the next one uh, is to uh, try and uh, make, a, make them out of reach by uh, bringing the soil to the, to the pier, so to say, by having artificial islands, which, if the water is not too deep, can work very well, especially if you can do it on the shore and say, okay, instead of 30 meter more bridge span, I make a 30 meter bulbous uh, uh, island there then you can try to deflect uh, a, a ship from the piers which is reasonable I would say for smaller ships on smaller rivers 
I've shown you the example in Berlin and uh, at, at the Neckar. And if you, if those things don't help because the water is too deep and too wide, then you can either strengthen the pier itself and get to so that it can take in a proper combination, of course, uh, the ship collision, and for that, for strengthening, you always have the aid that the dead load of the bridge coming down, for example, at the tower, helps to withstand the horizontal force from uh, an impact. If, for example, the bridge is already done and the authorities suddenly see the light and say, ah, we must do something against ship collision, then you may not be able to afterwards strengthen the bridge. It may have been possible during the design phase, but when the bridge is set and done, very difficult. Then you may have to design an independent uh, structure. Now, the bridge pier itself, which you strengthen, cannot deflect uh, very, very much. Oh, I'm too long. So, we are done anyway. I'm sorry, I was wrong. Yes, I got, I thought, 10, uh, 11.05, it's 10.50. It's okay, so you have to have an independent support which must have way to deflect uh, in, uh, by, by yielding. Okay, thank you very much. Well, welcome back. Uh, this has been a fascinating day and unique lectures. One, nothing to do technically with things as such that numbers are so important or that. But yes, aesthetics of bridges in general and collision of ships and barges with different types of structures on the water, different types of bridges in shallow foundations and deep foundations, depending upon the soil condition and depending upon the flow velocity, the DWT, whether it's a Panax vessel or a Panama class vessel or a or a, the DWT is graded, as you know, something that goes through the Panama Canal has, is called a Panax class ship. And navigation could be one way, two way, uh, and so on. There could be currents involved. And the Murphy Law and the Drunken Sailor always stands out as a, a good uh, thing to keep in mind. With that, uh, let me quickly ask for maximum of one to two minutes from each of our panelists, starting with uh, Professor Tandon. Can I request you two minutes, sir? Uh, okay. So, uh, in two minutes, I can say that, you know, he uh, mentioned about the collaboration between architects and engineers. Right. I think that these are not normal architects. If you look at a country like France, any major structure of some dimension, yes, you have to have an architect associated with the project. Then you put on your video. You are not. I visible. cannot because the host has <laughs> blocked it. No. <laughs> so, okay, I love to he has not blocked my. <laughs> no, no, sir, I am not, sir. You are. <laughs> okay, ah. now he is unblocked. <laughs> uh, now, now you are visible. <laughs> okay. Yes. Please admire my T-shirt at least. <laughs> yeah, yeah, beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> they look at the color. Ah. Yes, it yes, matches. Yes. It Aesthetic matches with my shirt. beautiful. You are an aesthetic mode. <laughs> well, it matches with my shirt. Go ahead, sir. <laughs> yes. So, just to tell you, these are special architects who work on these major structures, and they know all about uh, you know what yes, to do. Generic. They may not be planning buildings. It's not a building architect who who, who does this work in France. So this collaboration is essential. That is one thing I wanted to mention. There is, uh, I agree, I think it was uh, probably Max who mentioned about the, you know, a single plane of stay. 
uh, that which Professor Holger Svensson doesn't like, I think that he was, although he put it in the aesthetics, what he was trying to say was that it does not give you an, uh, a feeling of protection which you would get if, the, uh, if you had stays on both sides. So if you have a single stay with, uh, you know, the, the column uh, which you can see the pylon, but I don't agree with it. I think one of the most beautiful bridges which he had shown in, in his presentation also is the Broton Bridge, which was made in the late 70s. And the people who were connected with that bridge in the design were all the people that he mentioned. Jean Muller, uh, Jacques Mathiva, and Jacques Cambo. All the three French engineers which he has mentioned in his lectures, they were all the engineers at the same place and they were responsible for the design. And I believe that that is still one of the most beautiful bridges in the world. Uh, just one comment on the protection against ship collision. He mentioned that uh, it's a, a very real issue. I think that it is a real issue. In India, uh, Goa is a prime example where a number of times the ships have collided with bridge piers. And uh, it is all because of the same reason that the exact word is inebriation of the pilot, which means that he's drunk. I mean, it's, it's just putting it in a language so that it has less of an impact. That's about all. So he and, was in Goa uh, mode. Uh, sorry? He was in Goa mode, sir. Yes, Goa mode. I think that in any case, people in that city, whether they are from the city or from out of the city, they have a tendency towards inebriation in any case. So uh, it is a real problem. And uh, that's what I wanted to mention, that even in India, it's a problem. It's not uh, some big ship. The in, in Goa, on the Mandavi River, if you have seen, there are manganese ores which are being transported by barges right. uh, you know to the to the shipyard and uh, they all pass through the mandavi bridges so it's a very very real issue okay thank you right sir thank you for that uh, uh, alok do you want to say some technical or some issues and comments on this two lectures yeah so <clears throat> of course uh, only one thing i want to add to what professor tandon said uh, that uh, fortunately uh, we we do not have ships for our uh, you know inland uh, river bridges we have barges and the forces are much 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 less so we have not really seen failures as uh, professor holger swenson demonstrated in several bridges major bridges which has failed so that way we are a little lucky that all our bridges are only designed for barges of late and barges, the forces are much, uh, much less. Uh, I mean, uh, what to talk about the two lectures, they were both very, very fascinating and educative. Particularly, I liked the second lecture because there are a lot of new ideas which we, uh, we get for protection in terms of, you know, the uh, separate island or, uh, for, you know, sand island, whatever you call it or giving a separate protection in terms of floating pontoons. So there are three, four ideas which he has uh, marked. Though in India, I don't think we have except few bridges, uh, except for directly uh, uh, sort of taking the force of barge for ship impact in the, in the bridge. I don't think there are many examples where we have used this, uh, you know, uh, floating uh, 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 you know, separate separate foundation for taking the barge impact. Uh, so uh, I think you can. Uh, uh, I mean, I have no more for no right. more comments. Independent structure. You are talking about yeah, an independent yeah. structure to absorb the ship impact. Yeah, also yeah. important to note is one way and two way navigation and the huge disparity that exists between the Astro code and the Euro code in the impact force that is taken. I mean, that is an ongoing issue and we might have to reach our own conclusions, especially with Bombay, the Trans Harbour link, if it had 
that is one uh, you know we may have many other crossings across bays and navigable channels whether it be a cable stay or whether it be a long span bridge yeah incidentally might have to yeah incidentally i just wanted to mention that you know last year i think 2019 uh, there are some 112 waterways which are declared as national waterway, waterway yeah. for uh, so there are many more rivers where the design of bridges will have to take into account the barge impact forces and secondly the you know the modern set of barges that uh, we see now in india they are designed for much higher velocity speed and therefore the present codal provisions needs also an upgradation because the design speed for which we are actually designing are much on the lower side as compared to the design speed which they are claiming i recently have had an interaction with yes. the inland water transport authority yes. uh, in with relation to irc6 provisions and they are informing us that the design speed is much higher and yes. the force is square of the velocity yes so mv square forces yeah. are going to increase yes yeah plus 5% water <laughs> which we have to consider as he was saying max anything to add max uh yeah okay uh the uh, uh, less uh, the lecture about the uh, ship impact i think uh, it's important that uh, uh, owner consultant uh, gets clear uh, uh, during uh, before really starting with the design what the assumption shall be uh, as you have seen uh, uh, retrofits uh, at the later stage may be difficult maybe Uh, that uh, leads back to the aesthetics. Uh, you look at the Calatravas uh, bridge, the one he designed uh, for Berlin, right? Uh, a very light arch, and uh, uh, ignoring or not knowing, or I don't know what, that there is the risk there of uh, uh, ships uh, colliding with his light structure, and then uh, they have to build this ugly-looking guide structure, which uh, uh, makes all the efforts of Calatravas basically uh, in vain. Right? <laughs> Uh, so it's very important that uh, uh, at the very beginning uh, you get uh, clarity about uh, this uh, magnitude of loads, what you have to consider. It affects indeed uh, the span lengths, right? You have, uh, you have seen uh, the various options you have to mitigate these risks. One of them is to increase span lengths, and uh, that has to be done, obviously, at the very beginning of the design process. Just one uh, last comment on the aesthetics. I uh, totally agree with Professor Benton, and for me the... Uh, uh, easiest cable stay bridges to look aesthetically uh, nice are single plane uh, stay cable bridges. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe one thing which has not been mentioned uh, by uh, Professor Holger Svensson is uh, uh, what also very important for aesthetics, the transition to the approach structures. Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, he, he, he was giving an example of uh, uh, it's good to show how forces are anchored. I totally agree with that. But the example he did show there had a, a rather ugly looking transition to the approach spans. Yes. And, uh, uh, and the last point is uh, all the furniture which come uh, on bridges, drainage pipes, right? How often you see very nice, uh, nicely, uh, uh, nice piers with nice texture and so on being built, a lot of effort put in, and then finally uh, people come and put uh, drainage pipes all over the place and uh, uh, really the whole thing is is not looking good. right yeah Thank thanks you. max thanks uh, for those comments thanks uh, i'll just read to you from the book the jury for design competition should always contain a majority of engineers not architects <laughs> in order to avoid the winning design not being realized for technical or economic problems as a result of the above considerations, it can be stated that a well-designed bridge has a clear structural system, has harmonic proportions and good order, fits the surroundings, and is as, as simple as possible. For such a well-designed technical and economical requirements are not contradictory to beauty. Contrary to widespread belief, a beautiful bridge is not necessarily more expensive than an ugly one. A bridge becomes, however, more expensive if the flow of forces is wrong. A beautiful bridge requires only an additional effort of technical and architectural beauty. That's the last three paragraphs of that chapter on aesthetics. 
and the chapter on ship collision does not exist in the book. It is only in the lectures, I'm sorry. But uh, Sharan Saab, anything to add? Yeah, I, I, I have uh, two points to make. Go ahead, sir. Uh, first, uh, aesthetic, uh, he has both uh, beautiful as well as ugly bridge. And apart from all the other bridges, uh, not uh, specifically cable street, but all along the, all the bridges aesthetically, a uh, beautiful bridge he has shown in the entire world. So that is very good uh, thing which we are uh, there. And then coming back to the uh, your uh, a ceiling project which we are developing and the body, um, the ship impact to become very important. One point in which he made that uh, this GWT is more important than the speed. Although Alok was mentioning that the velocity will play a, um, a great role as per collision force is concerned. But uh, Professor Holger has made it very clear in his uh, presentation that uh, uh, DWT is more important and speed may not be playing a very specific role. Then he has uh, taken Astro, then Euro, and then Peterson, all this uh, curve for collision force he has shown there. And even, uh, even half the force of Peterson was uh, more than uh, what, what is as per the Astro force were there. So Euro code uh, also force were there. So that is one thing. Then coming back to the, our um, inside the country, uh, this uh, inland um, national uh, waterway, which is very much there. And uh, moreover, we are concentrating inland water transport on this uh, barges. And most of the um, rivers has been declared as uh, your uh, NS, uh, just like NS, uh, different uh, waterways. So that is becoming more and more important. So um, as on date, we are using fenders to protect our peers. But the way he has shown that uh, it can be done artificially, and one of the, in the case of Argentina, he has said that the um, authority realized at later date that uh, bridges to be protected. I don't know what will happen in Bandra Bali ceilings, whether it is uh, going to be uh, navigational and ships are allowed to move. If that happens, then uh, what is the solution there? Uh, we have to uh, think over. Uh, whether uh, he has said he has made number of uh, suggestions that how to protect our uh, peers. Uh, so it can be done with an artificial peer, shallow, deep, not water. So these are the things are there. And so what is most important for our B9 committee from today has that when we are developing more work for Mr. Harsa now, that uh, <laughs> uh, <the laughs> collision, ship collision uh, for <laughs> even for inside India, maybe from Putra or not. But when we are definitely going to connect Bangladesh and the Sri Lanka, then what will be there? And we have to also look into our um, um, uh, what we are developing under ceilings. So this point needs to be, at least uh, we have to make a reference that uh, although he said that uh, ship collusion may not be per month, but uh, it is happening in the entire world. That is the real, as Mr. Tandana also mentioned, that he has mentioned it is the reality that uh, we have to live with it. That is what is coming out from the today's presentations as the collisions of the ship with the, uh, our um, bridges are concerned. So we have to live with it and we have to find solution for that. That is all. Thank right. you. Uh, just uh, let, yeah, go ahead, Alo. I just wanted to add, uh, clarify, uh, Sharan Saab, that you know the distinction between uh, the behavior of a barge and the ship, they are different. Very different. Because a ship Correct. has got a very high mass, very large mass. Is, mass is predominant in ship the speed is low, whereas barges on the contrary, they have lower mass, but a high speed because being light, you know, it is so, so for barges, the speed has uh, more influence than the mass. Whereas for ships, the mass has more influence than the, uh, the ki kinetic energy is half MV square. So, so basically so, that perhaps justifies yeah. That a different yeah. consideration for barges and different consideration for no, ships. No, Mr. Alok, one point also, I just because uh, when uh, collision takes place uh, between uh, ships and uh, our bridges, then both are getting damaged. So they must be doing R&D for ship development also. They must be finding some ways how to protect their ship against the collision. So it is a two-way two -way journey. We will be protecting definitely our bridge. But at the same time, a ship uh, which is a costly... Um, propositions, they must be also having R&D, how to make it more flexible there is, sir. and how to make impact. So that is also things are there. So that, uh, that yes. needs to be. So it is both way journey. 
That's right. In fact, oil tankers will be multi-hulled and isolated. Multi-hazard. So yeah, yeah multi-hazard and also the approach velocities and the angle of approach and the one-way, two-way navigation, one-way direction, two directions, and the drift at which it comes in. All these are aspects of uh, barge impact or ship impact design. And for ships, especially for long cable stays, for example, the ship that goes below the mast height and the class, the DWD class, which are categorized as, you know, Panax class or Suez class like that, which can go through those canals because of their draft, the ship which can go through those. That category, if it's coming to your port, you have to consider, or to your area, you have to consider that uh, DWT. So these are all additional issues we shouldn't uh, uh, one point well, more. Mr. Artha, just, go ahead, Artha, one point which has just come to my mind, uh, Mr. Mr. Alok, what you, did you do anything in Sultan Gan Place? Because this is the uh, inland water, uh, uh, that is the uh, national waterway. So there are a lot number of piers are there, a long bridge also. So you right. must have taken some protection there. So can you just uh, tell us how yeah. you have the Yes, yes. So uh, you see, they there are, uh, I mean, the Sultan Ganj Bridge is divided into three zones, distinct zones. The one is the main uh, river zone in which all the piers have been designed for barge impact forces. And uh, uh, I mean, that includes a part of the cable straight portion of the bridge and also some parts of the extra dose portion of the bridge. Then there are, uh, other than the main river zone, there are floodplains in which we have viaducts. Even those are designed for an errant uh, uh, barge, which can probably go and hit. For that, uh, the, you know, the class of waterway considered is on the lower side and the speed on the lower side, but they are also designed for a force which may be around 30% of the forces for which the main uh, viaduct portion has been designed. Thank you, Alok. So the half MV squared, the V can be higher or the M can be higher based upon the ship or the barge and the various considerations regarding the depth and the uh, location. Very well uh, put, uh, Alok. Thanks. Uh, now, let me read to you a few of the comments before we'll uh, you know, have a formal word of thanks. Uh, Sarkar says, thanks, Professor Swenson, for this beautiful journey. Mitali Das, thank you, Professor, for your presence to the web. Uh, lovely lecture series, Natarajan Krishnamurti. Um, sir, when can we expect the guidelines on cable stay bridges to be published? We are all curious about it. This is Nisad Kulkarni. Soon, my friend, soon. These, all these in information will come there. Much of this learning for us also as panelists. We have the convener and the chairperson here <laughs> as a panelist. I think the draft will be ready uh, by the end of the year. Uh, so we will leave today. We will have more wiser. That's will give us there, there's, uh, state of the art. <laughs> there are other questions which have been more or less answered. So let us not dwell on that with this lovely sets of lectures. Let me uh, uh, then start probably to close this session and record my formal vote of thanks. Uh, Alok, anything to add before we do that? No, I just, uh, I think if you can just uh, tell the participants once again about the forthcoming two uh, uh, important, uh, you know, webinar and, the, and uh, two, one webinar and one uh, course, lecture course. And uh, we, I just would like to request all the participants, those who are not members of Indian Association of Structural Engineers, to please consider seriously taking the membership. Uh, I mean, it, it will help you a lot. And also it will help the association to build a good, a strong community or, or engineering fraternity to take our interest forward. Very true. Very true. And topics that you would like, any workshops that you would like, uh, we, we would be very happy to provide the fora and the platform and whatever expertise we have to enhance our professional development, continuing professional development. Please take this opportunity to join the ISTRAC team. On that note, uh, uh, Vikas, can you show those two, that slide of the two courses we have, please? Vikas? Yeah. So uh, I would like to announce uh, the next slide. The next slide. Yeah, I would. Sorry. Yeah, I would like to announce two courses: Wind Engineering for Long Span Bridges Part Two, on October 28, 2020, at from 11 o'clock to 1 o'clock. 
The speaker will be K. Suresh Kumar, one of the authorities on wind engineering. Uh, he's a vice president of a famous company for wind engineering, RWDI, and this will be a second talk with I. Strakti. We will make available to you the first talk through a YouTube link, and this will be moderated by none other than Dr. Prem Krishna, considered the foremost authority on bridge, uh, uh, bridge wind engineering in India. The second one is by Dr. Sogata Roy from the University of New Jersey, which will be somewhere towards the end of the month and will be moderated by our own Raj Shirke, who's MD of Spectrum Techno Consult. And this will be on fatigue and fracture. We will give the exact dates because Professor Sogata will be changing his schedule, et cetera, and fitting in for the three day course for us somewhere around the end of November from 3.30 to 6.30 for three contiguous days. And you can see the various topics that will be covered, not only steel bridges, but also concrete bridges, uh, the general principles, and also concrete and steel bridges and, and, and so on. So with that, let me, uh, you can switch the screen off and boot full screen, Avikas, back to normal screen. Yeah. Uh, so with that, it is my pleasant duty to once again propose a formal vote of thanks. It is my pleasant duty to propose a formal vote of thanks on behalf of ISTRAC T. Words are insufficient to express our sincere gratitude to Professor Svensson for permitting us to share his unique and phenomenal recorded lecture series based on his book, Cable State Bridges, 40 Years of Experience Worldwide. This course has greatly enriched our participants by furthering their professional development and inspiring them to take on with confidence challenging cross cable state bridges in India and elsewhere. We record our special thanks to our president Alok Bomik, Mr. Vipul Ahuja, chairman of our subcommittee for courses, workshops and events and its members, Professor Mahesh Tandon, past president of ISTRAKTI, Mr. Umesh Raj Shirke and others without whose enthusiasm and commitment this workshop would not have happened. The expert panelists from India and abroad deserve our thanks for taking the time off their schedules and sharing with us their domain expertise and greatly enhancing the value of this workshop with their expert comments and observations. Max, we thank you especially for being here with us and for having been with us on four such events and adding, adding your great contribution, which will re be reflected in our guidelines. Many of your comments will see their way into our guidelines. Uh, I also recall Mike Schleich and Boris Wiesler and all the other international experts. We were lucky to have Rashid from VSL, technical head of VSL, recommended by Max, and all these others who have contributed, apart from our Indian acknowledged experts and bridge experts, with whom you see us uh, often. Uh, Mr. Vikas Verma, manager IS Trakti, is a pillar of our institution, and his dedication and hard work deserve an unequivocal praise and thanks. His meticulous follow-up on all admin publicity and web matters have allowed a smooth running of this 30 lecture series without any glitch whatsoever. But most of all, excellent, absolutely because cheers. But most of all, thanks to our wonderful participating bridge engineers, your keenness for knowledge will spur ISTRACTI on to bring you many more such events unique ones, of course, in your quest for continuing professional development. It has been most rewarding and my particular pleasure to have served as your moderator. I close. Before I close, I would I like to acknowledge to... all our sponsors whom you see behind me and behind all of us, Magiba, Dilip Birkan, S.P. Singla, Maura, Maura Sandfield, and uh, uh, the, uh, and if I missed out any others, I, I, I apologize, but all the sponsors who've stood by us and will continue to stand by us in this quest to share knowledge and grow. I close. May, Hello, I, may I have the last word, Harsha? Yeah, I will, I will. I, I just want to say, uh, okay, you have that, then I'll have one last comment I want to make. Go ahead. Go ahead, Alok. Okay, so I, I think let us all give a standing ovation to our moderator, Dr. Harshavardhan Subarao. <laughs> for such an excellent yeah. conduct yeah, of yeah. this entire lecture series. Hats off to you, Parallel. Harsha. Parallel. I think Parallel. unparalleled. Thank you, and man. at the same time, I would like to profusely thank Professor Mahesh Tandon and Mr. Sharan, who have been there 
for all the lectures yes. as a panelist and yes. giving enlightening us and giving their valuable contribution yes uh, uh, the contribution of uh, mr max mayer is no less i think he has been the panelist in this particular lecture series for at least five or six if not, if not more and yes. he has not only uh, 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 sort of uh, you know as a panelist contributed here but on the background also through emails he has been sharing his experience after every um, lecture and this is something immense contribution uh, my, uh, my sincere thanks to you max for this you are most welcome uh, and uh, all those mr alok uh, we have to thank the prime mover you are the prime mover so we cannot <laughs> or get the prime mover without prime mover we nothing can move right. so i think i think we are petting each other's back no, now no, let us close let us over close to on that happy note with the relief of the complete series having gone successfully yeah. and and that i i would like to close and welcome you thank you thank you somewhere by saying three cheers and salute to guru holger svensson good night yeah good night my all. my salute to professor holger svensson who has yeah. given us enlightened us through these 30 lectures thank you thank you all and good night thank, thank you, you.